Your perspective changes when the trauma becomes personal. I distinctly remember that he was young, black, and he looked like me. He was covered in blood, the same as me, but the only difference was that he was a patient who laid on a stretcher after being shot in the face and the chest, and I was the physician who pronounced him dead. He was killed by another young man that looked like him who was also being treated for gunshot wounds in the room next door. Coincidentally, the perpetrator was shot two years prior by the dead man. This unfortunate scene of young black men being brutally injured or dead because of violence is common where I work. But despite its frequency, I keep asking myself why. According to the Center for Disease Control, the number one cause of death for black men ages 15 to 34 is homicide. Not illness, not accidental injury, but death due to force. And it's difficult to understand the how and the why of violence when you don't see the effects of violence up close. Like when there are regular shootings on the other side of the city, police brutality in someone else's community, illegal gang activity in someone else's school, or war in someone else's country. But recently publicized mass casualty shootings have shown us that we are all vulnerable regardless of where we live. Which makes the bystander and the veteran, the teacher and the sibling, the first grader and the gangbanger all equally affected by violence. And if they do survive a violent injury, how the consequential post-traumatic stress is diffused will depend on the immediate treatment the survivors receive. Early in my training, I became familiar with the concept known as the golden hour of trauma, which stresses the need for early treatment the first hour after a traumatic injury. I later learned of a concept known as the second golden hour of trauma, which stresses that an early intervention could change the scope of violent injury and make sure retaliation doesn't occur. It's almost expected that a survivor of a mass casualty shooting be offered both counseling and victim services. There's usually a different level of empathy shown towards these patients, but that doesn't always happen when you have a young black or Latino male that comes in shot. Had those services been available, I wonder if an early intervention would have prevented retaliation from occurring between my two patients, because it was obvious that the two were suffering from something that hadn't been addressed yet. I get angry pronouncing young black men dead and I get frustrated at the limited psychosocial resources available to victims of gang and interpersonal violence. So to better cope with my work reality, and in the spirit of the second golden hour of trauma, I put together a team. A team made up of friends, family, colleagues, and students. And we developed a hospital, school, and community-based violence intervention and prevention program called CAVI, also known as the Kings Against Violence Initiative. We work with patients that have been injured because of violence, and we work with at-risk youth to make sure they don't become patients, but more so to help increase opportunities that extend beyond street life. And we do this work through mentoring, counseling, and programs that help our participants develop coping strategies and tools to deal with life stressors. A while ago, I heard a phrase, hurt people hurt people. I'm going to say it again, but this time slower. Hurt people hurt people. Because when you're hurting and have no one to turn to and have no one to talk to, it's easy to feel marginalized. It's easy for you to want others to feel the same exact pain and suffering that you've been experiencing. Like one of my students. One of my students had been going through some personal problems. And he's also in a gang. But he decided to put a hit out on another student to have him killed because of a recent beef or conflict he had. Luckily, he retracted the hit after extensive meetings with our staff, but my student, along with so many others that look like us, are hurting. And the reason they're hurting is because they haven't processed or dealt with or treated their past traumas. They're constantly reliving their traumas. And when the code of the street tells you if there's a conflict that you have to respond aggressively, it makes perfect sense that you're going to use violence to deal with your problems. 
thus continuing the cycle of trauma. And when these emotions and these experiences go unchanged and unchecked, and you put that in an unforgiving environment, there's eventually a tipping point with the result being a violent aftermath, making it easy for the unsupported to become the perpetrators. My students don't want to be in gangs, and my patients don't want to be victims. They want to go to school, they want to go to work, they want to be validated, they want equal opportunity, but most of all, they want to live. Thank you.